scripture this morning once again comes from the Gospel of Mark, passage that um, I've just grown to love over the years, and I think many of you do too. Mark chapter 9, it's kind of a long passage, a, a, a story that unfolds, so I'll just be reading it myself, but um, let's pray together before we read it. Lord God in heaven, we thank you that your word is true. And we thank you for real people that we read about in your scriptures. And we thank you for the way your spirit worked and works. And Father, we pray that these hearts of ours and minds of ours and our whole selves will be open to your spirit so that you do far more in us and through us, through faith in Jesus, than we could ever imagine. In Christ's name, amen. Mark chapter 9 at verse 14. Listen to the word. When they came to the other disciples, they, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as All the people saw Jesus. They were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought to you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but... They could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him, and when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. This is the word of God. My wife is a very good cook. I mean, she's an extremely good cook. Now, I don't come here this morning to to try to provoke jealousy I know that not all of you have a good cook in your home, but, but I do. We have a very good cook at our house. My wife is very good at it. Once in a while, however, she'll, she'll make something and then, and then she'll say, hey, taste this. What's it missing? Oh, far be it for me to answer that question. What's it missing? I don't, I have no idea. Give me a few hints. At least that question is better than when she buys something new and says, how do you like it? (laughs) This is safer than that question, but what's it missing? And and lots of times I just don't know what it's missing. Give me some suggestions. What do you think it needs? Because I don't know. I don't have a clue what's it missing. You read this passage and right away you know what's missing, right? Right? When I read that passage, as you listen to that passage unfold, you know what was missing in this passage. Faith. Faith is missing from the passage. It seems absent. 
Uh, faith is, is just distant in the story. It doesn't matter who you look at, where you look. seems like everyone disbelieves. There are people who are doubting. It's a story that's, uh, that's filled with unbelief. I mean, whether you're talking about the crowds, whether you call them spectators or whether you call them seekers, whatever they were, they, they don't know what's going on. Whether you talk about those teachers, the teachers of the law, they are arguing with the disciples and it seems like, I, I can't say for sure, but it seems like they're having a good time because they are confronting the disciples who can't do what they're supposed to do. Whether you're talking about the man in the story who has faith, but not a lot of it, or whether you are talking about Jesus' disciples themselves, no matter where you look, there's not much faith. Faith in this story is missing in action. Where's the faith? Who believes? It just seems like doubt is written all over this passage. If you take a look at the story, at chapter 9, verse 19, it says this, You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? Jesus sounds exasperated at that point. I don't believe that I'm reading into the text when I say that. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? It makes it sound like Jesus fully expect, expected more faith by this time. Who's Jesus talking to there? Who's it about? Is it about the disciples? It seems that way to me, but maybe it's about the man. Maybe it's everyone there. How long am I supposed to stay here until you believe? How come you don't yet believe? Now, believing is something that God expects of us. That's what Christianity is. It's believing with our heads that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. It's trusting this Lord Jesus with our hearts. It involves our head. It involves our hearts. It involves our whole beings. It's trusting in this Jesus. How long shall I put up with you? You don't yet believe I also think of that passage from John chapter 12, I think it is. And it says there in John chapter 12, even after Jesus had performed all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still did not believe. Now, lots of times I think, you know, if I can see how people wrestle to believe, but if I had seen Jesus perform all these miraculous signs, if I had watched them with my own eyes, wouldn't I have believed quite easily? I like to think I would, but there's some reason that there was a whole lot of unbelief going around. Now, some unbelief isn't a bad thing, really. I'm not saying to you this morning that you should believe absolutely everything that you hear. A little skepticism is good for the soul. I think especially in this day and age when, you, when we're bombarded with so much information, you know, whenever, whenever you're on the net, whenever you're, you're scrolling through, whenever you're seeing stories, you've you got to ask yourself, is this true? Is this right? I mean, you've got to have some skepticism these days because everything that you read is not true. Every story that you're told is not correct. You've got to have a healthy dose of skepticism. Don't believe everything you see. Don't believe everything you hear. Don't believe everything you read. And I've got to sadly admit, it's even true that even when they're Christian sources, even from some Christian websites, even, even some Christian books I read, sometimes I think they're wrong, but sometimes I wonder if they're intentionally wrong. Don't believe everything. And that's why the Bible tells us to, to discern the spirits. And that's why it tells us to dig into the scriptures to see if those things are true. Don't believe everything you hear. A little skepticism is good for the soul. But not too much skepticism. So on one hand, I want to say, don't believe everything you hear. 
but don't become an unbeliever. Are you with me? Don't believe everything, but don't become an unbeliever. One thing God wants us to do is believe. To believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who has been raised from the dead and raised to life. Believe in him. Trust him. Believe. But as I said in this story, unbelief pops up everywhere. Take a look. Chapter 9, verse 17. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. And it makes it sound like this man fully expected the disciples of Jesus to be able to drive out that spirit. He expected that they were able to do that. And if you go back to, to, to Mark chapter 6, you see that Jesus gives his disciples authority over unclean spirits. He gives them the authority to drive them out. And then you read later on in Mark chapter 6 that they were driving out spirits. So yes, indeed, it is expected of them that they can do this. I've got to admit that sometimes when I read about this and read about what Jesus empowered the disciples to do here and, and that this man expected them to be able to cast out the spirit out of his son... When I read that, I, I feel a little sympathetic toward the disciples. And I ask myself, would I have that kind of faith? One time I received a phone call. I received a phone call from, from a woman I had never met before or didn't know anything about her. But she says, I'd like to come and see you. And um, it was kind of, kind of strange for me because usually you know some connection, but I really think that she had just driven by the church, saw the sign, called, called the number. Uh, I think we had number at the time. And, and, and anyway, and so um, I said, sure. Um, made an appointment. She came, and, um, and when she came, she just jumped right in. I think my son's possessed. Now, now, like I said, I no background information, didn't tell me the story, but she says, I think my son's possessed by a spirit. And, and she, she tells me this, these stories, and it didn't sound like mental illness. It didn't sound like, um, it didn't sound like any sort of disease. It sounded like someone possessed. And so she, she tells me the story, and then she asks me what to do. And, you know, I was kind of wide-eyed because I had never heard the stories that she had told me and the, the sounds of such a possession because I believed she was correct. And I told her in the name of Jesus, these are some of the things that you can do. And I never saw her again. I never know the story. She never brought her son in. We never prayed over him. Now, now, I don't know what happened. But if she would have brought her son back and said, here's my son, would I have had the faith, the confidence to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, leave? I don't know. Sometimes I feel sympathetic for the disciples. Would I have that kind of faith to drive out the enemy? But it's fully expected that they should have been able to do this. Jesus gave them that kind of authority. I brought my son to, to you, but they couldn't do anything about it. Nothing. Nothing. And right after this, Jesus says, you unbelieving generation. Is he talking about the disciples? Maybe. But then it goes on. The story goes on. Verse 21. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But 
if you, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And I believe that's exactly where many people are. I do believe. But I also doubt. I do believe. Help me overcome that unbelieving part of me. I I should spell out, I believe there's a difference between people who wrestle with doubt and unbelief. I believe that unbelief is, is... Unbelief. It's refusing to believe in the Lord. It's not believing in the Lord. But I do believe that there are people who do believe who wrestle with doubt. That is, I do believe, but sometimes I wrestle with unbelief. I, I wrestle with doubts. Lee, Lee Strobel uh, tells this story. Someone said to him, or wrote to him, I need your help. I see so many people around the church who have such a strong faith that I feel like I don't fit in. I would like to feel confident. I wish I didn't have doubts, but I've got more questions than answers. Now I'm beginning to doubt whether I'm a Christian at all. Can you relate to any of this? What should I do? Could you get back to me right away? And Strobel's answer was this. Let me offer some words of encouragement. You can have strong faith and still have doubts. And I believe he's completely right. We're not talking about stubborn unbelief that you don't believe in the Lord at all, but some of us do have doubts. And sometimes they get the better of us. I can see why people doubt. Sometimes they're intellectual doubts. One of the things I'm really thankful for, one of the things I'm hearing, you know, Wes, when he's talking with with the young people these days, one of the things he's been doing this past year is talking about reasons why you can believe. And I think that's great. Soon, soon our young people will be out of the house and they go off to college and wherever they go and they'll hear all sorts of ideas and Wes is helping prepare them. You can hear these things, hear reasons why you can believe. When it comes to apologetics and defending the faith, you know, I'm not so sure that we can always convince unbelievers, but we can show ourselves as believers we have good reason to believe. But sometimes they're intellectual questions. Sometimes people have doubts because of, well, sometimes they have doubts because, because God doesn't always answer our prayers. At least not the way we were hoping he would answer them. And sometimes we doubt because we prayed and we prayed and we prayed for something. And sometimes we start to give up. We begin to doubt. And sometimes I believe that people begin to doubt because they take a look at life. A tornado comes through town, wipes out a whole town. Why? We can't explain it. We can't say why. We don't know. Don't give the answers to stuff that are beyond us. But I can understand why there are times in our lives why we do have doubts. It does happen. But here is the most important thing, I believe, when it comes to doubt. What do you do about it? What do you do about it? And now I'm going to make something sound extremely simple. And maybe you think, Pastor Matt, you should be a little more sophisticated than this. You should have a little more depth to you than this. You you should go a little beyond what you're going to say. But if you wrestle with doubts, there's one thing you should do. Turn to Jesus. You see, when we doubt, usually we do just the opposite. 
And maybe that's one of the reasons why we begin to doubt is because we're doing the opposite already. But one of the reasons, one of the things to do when you begin to doubt is the only thing to do is to turn to Jesus. But when we doubt, lots of times, that's when we stop doing that. When we start doubting, that's the time when we don't pray so much. When we doubt, that's the time when maybe we don't read or study the Word when we're doubting. Oh, what difference does it make? When we're doubting, lots of times, that's when we stop worshiping or become sporadic in our worship. We stop doing those things. We stop turning to Jesus. And when you stop turning to Jesus, the doubts grow. What do you do when those doubts are there? You do exactly what this man did. You turn toward Jesus. I do believe, and I will not allow this unbelief to keep me away from you. I do believe. Help thou my unbelief. Help me overcome it. You are not guaranteed that you are never, ever going to doubt. But what do you do with your doubt? Don't let it rule your life. Turn to Jesus. Keep coming back to Jesus. Don't quit. Don't quit when those doubts emerge. Keep coming back to him. Now this gets really interesting after this. This man helped me overcome my unbelief. He has a problem believing. He has a problem overcoming his doubt. But then you got the disciples yet, right? You got the rest of the story. And then the disciples say to Jesus, Jesus, why couldn't we do it? Why couldn't we drive it out? They seem incredulous about this whole thing. Why couldn't we do it? We tried. We tried to drive it out. Maybe they said the right words. They did something. They didn't just sit there. They didn't sit there silently. They said something. They did something, but nothing happened. And what does Jesus say? This kind comes out only by prayer. Now, I'm not writing into the text, but I'm asking the text this question. Did the disciples attempt to drive out this demon without even praying? The most important thing for our faith, it's turning to Jesus. It's prayer. No, I can't do this myself. I cannot make this happen. I cannot achieve this. The only thing I can do is I can bring it to you, Jesus. Did they try to do it without praying? Jen DeVries uh, was, uh, was a well-known man in the Christian reform circles and well beyond uh, doing so much good work for the kingdom of God, Mission India, and all the rest. And, and he has some wonderful stories in, in one of the books that, that he wrote. And, and in it, he, he says, you know, there are a number of different people who would, who would criticize me and say, John, why is it that when we have meetings and we have so much work to do, so many decisions to make, so much ground to cover. And, and some said this, you waste so much time praying. Because too often we think it's what we do. And we don't realize it's what God does through us. So it seems like the disciples were caught up in this, we can do this. No, no. No, you can't. Only God can do this. Never try doing it without praying. And we don't mean just slap a prayer at the end of everything, but, but live in that spirit of prayer. Look what our God can do. But one thing Satan doesn't want you to do is pray. 
And when these doubts emerge, when you have questions, the first thing that he's going to be whispering in your ear is, why pray? Don't pray. It doesn't make any difference. Don't let him have the last word. Keep turning to Jesus. Keep praying. It's the most important thing we can do. It is. Let's pray together now.